we are waiting for dr rasik shah right yeah. i'm supposed to start when somebody tells me to start right i will yes yeah okay yes yes okay uh, you have to start okay yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Bella, yes. can you see both the Zoom as well as YouTube chats? I'm seeing the YouTube on my phone, so I'll see the questions. So, do you want to do YouTube, and I can look at the chats on Zoom? Uh, so I'll be seeing the chat on the Zoom, but that is okay. only the part asking. Okay. If you get into trouble, tell me. Okay. It's not easy sometimes. If there are few questions, it's okay. Otherwise, it's not easy. Okay. So I will message you then. You'll keep an eye out for that. Yeah. Should I open the YouTube on my other laptop? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. I will message you then. You'll keep an eye out for that. YouTube on my other other laptop. Is that better? There is a lag. Huh? There is a lag. It's almost a 20 second lag for YouTube. So you will be a little behind. Therefore, it's best to take the questions at the end. I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. Think. Best to take them at the end. There will be a lag. There is a lag. It's almost a 20 second Too much screen time every day, you know? I need those blue. Yes. And then they'll also look very funky. This also because otherwise I'll be hearing. Yeah, people. but what do you do if you have number glasses? I don't wear my glasses, but I should. Maybe that'll help. As it is, the you know Wi-Fi in the hospital is so bad. You can't get YouTube on that Wi-Fi. Hmm. Oh, is it? And even Zoom is very bad. I use my dongle. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm not expecting lots of questions today because, you know, I don't talk about medications and also usually they don't come up. No. So, where uh, do the questions Dr. Bela? Where Dr. Bela? Yeah, hi. Tell me. Yeah, ma'am, we are live yeah. on YouTube. So, I think we should uh, start with our session. Okay, somebody has just joined. I don't know who. Where will the questions actually come up? Can you just tell me that? Uh, There's a small thing right at the bottom. You'll see chat. In YouTube? Yeah. You'll see a chat. On, it comes on the right side. Okay, live chat it says. Live chat, yeah. You'll see them there. Okay. Okay, so should I start? So, uh, yeah. Yes, and on, on that live chat itself, tell them where to put the questions. Because many people may not know. So someone is just joining in. Uh, three, four, eight, six, double zero. Who's that? Uh, uh, Ma'am, you may start. So I just start speaking. We are already yeah. live. Yes, we are already live, ma'am. Yes, ma we are live. Um, Bela, Bela, um, make me a co-host so you can uh, ignore the Zoom entries. Otherwise, you'll be very distracted. Okay, but I can't. I, I, I can't one uh, allow pat participants to share screen. Yes, do that. Do that. Chat and make and a host it. or co-host so that do uh, you don't have to keep a, a allowing participants in. Is there any other host? No, there isn't. Make me co-host or host or whatever. Co-host. I can only make you host and then I will not be host. That's okay. You don't need to be. I can put you back later. Okay. You just allow screen sharing and the host. Yeah, you will end up having difficulty with two things, huh? With the chat and this, I've struggled before. Okay, but now can you? You can see me, and I can talk, right? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll start. Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, SRCC Children's Hospital. Uh, today is part of the master class, which usually you are used to seeing Doctor Rask. He's gotten a bit delayed today because of his surgery, but he will join us soon. Our talk today is on an approach to delay in speech in children. Uh, there are many myths associated with that also, which we will try to clear up. 
I invite Dr. Koili Sen Gupta. Dr. Koili is a developmental pediatrician. She is a consultant with us at the SRCC Children Managed by Narayana Health, as well as at the Umid Development Child Development Center at Parel. She runs the, the autism program at Umid. She is the, the, the director. Apart from all her clinical duties there, she uh, manages a lot of uh, you know, the teaching, the uh, uh, training for parents, as well as training uh, other professionals in is her, her main interest is in the autism, autism spectrum disorder age. So I invite Dr. Koili to start her talk. Welcome, Dr. Koili. Okay, we can't hear you. Sorry. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, that ubiquitous question that we've all been asking, am I audible and am I visible? So um, am I audible? <laughs> am I clear? Bila, is it okay? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Bela. And um, may I say that it is an absolute pleasure to be with all of you here on Zoom and YouTube. And thank you for taking the time out from your schedules to be with us today. Uh, thank you also to the management at NHSRCC Children's Hospital for organizing this series of masterclass and for making this a bridge between, you know, all of us who care deeply about children. Uh, so with that, I want to go on straight into our topic for today. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what a developmental pediatrician does, because sometimes people wonder what is this? And developmental pediatrician or developmental pediatrics is that subspecialty of pediatrics which is concerned deeply about developmental and behavioral issues in children. So um, our work encompasses looking at young children, teenagers, when parents come to us for concerns about their development, different areas of their development, including speech, communication, language, social skills, attention, academics, uh, behavioral difficulties. And our job is not just limited to diagnosis, but also helping parents navigate the journey. So we talk to parents about what are intervention resources, what are the therapies that are required, uh, how to navigate school. Sometimes there are issues with school, how to manage that. And we are often the ones who coordinate with other services that children require. So with that little brief, uh, let me move on to the talk for today. Uh, Dr. Kohli, would you like to just say what the format of this talk is going to be? Shall okay. We? So, yes, absolutely. So, um, what we are going to do today is I will talk briefly about what an approach to a child with speech delay should be. But we will primarily be doing this through very simple case scenarios. And Dr. Bela will be sharing some case scenarios with us. And we will quickly go through it. These are common case scenarios that are very likely uh, that you encounter them, come across them in your OPD practice. And we will talk about what that particular developmental profile is very likely to be. And uh, after we do that, we will, in general, just talk about uh, you know, what could be our, what should be the line of management. And we will finish with uh, two sets of questions. One is what are answers to some common questions that parents ask? And secondly, we will of course answer your questions and comments on the chat that you may share on YouTube as well as Zoom. So uh, with that, um, okay. Mm. Okay, there we go. Could you so, you know, in the past, we were happy if children survived. And we, the focus for our work has now shifted. It is no longer about children surviving, but now we want them to survive and thrive. And unfortunately, millions of children in our country do not reach their full developmental potential. And our job, as those of us who work with children and their families, our job is to try and change these outcomes. Now, 
Um, well, we are talking about developmental difficulties, but many people say that, um, is it that common? Is it really that common that we should spend, you know, one full hour on a Janmashtami rainy afternoon talking about speech delays and developmental difficulties? So I want you to take a minute to focus on this slide. These are very common childhood conditions, right? And let's look at the prevalence rate per thousand children. So the one that all of you, most of you are likely to encounter in the children that you see, for sure is childhood asthma. It occurs as commonly as 23, 24 kids to going up to 100 kids in out of 1,000. Congenital heart disease, we learn a lot about it. We learn a lot about how to manage juvenile diabetes, childhood tuberculosis, even childhood cancer. Let's look at developmental disabilities in comparison. Out of 1,000 kids, you will definitely see at least 25 kids who have a speech delay, which is somewhere on the lower range for what you see for asthma. One out of 100, which is 50 to 100 kids out of 1,000, will have difficulties with attention. And autism nowadays occurs as commonly, as frequently as 14 to 15 kids out of 1,000. So yes, developmental delays, including different forms of speech delays, are very common and it's very likely that you are seeing these children in your OPD on a regular basis. So what are speech delays? A speech delay is diagnosed when a child does not attain normal developmental milestones for speech at the expected age. However, speech is just one part. It's the spoken or the verbal part of a bigger spectrum of communication, okay? And why do I say that? Because sometimes speech delay is the, you know, just a broad bucket that everybody seems to dump their worries and concerns about children's communication. In. And I would like us to spend a little bit of time understanding that speech is just a part of communication and communication is a much broader bucket. It includes both expressive and receptive parts of communication. Expressive communication is that what we say, what people say, what they comment, share, describe, narrate, and it could be verbal or through the use of gestures, facial expressions, the way we you know, use our body language. And the other part of communication, so communication is a two-way street. And the other part, very important part of communication is receptive communication, which is what do people understand of what is expressed by others. And once again, this includes verbal as well as nonverbal. So how, how can I make out from seeing someone's body language that they are really bored? Or how can I make out from looking at a child that's pointing at something in the distance that that child really wants to buy that balloon or is very interested in looking at that bird that's sitting up there on the tree? So communication, therefore is much more than just speech. And an extension of that is that speech delays are not just about speech alone. So it's about expressive and receptive communication. And as we said, verbal, which includes oral and an extension of that as kids grow up is written language. So oral includes speaking and being able to listen to what is being said and reading of what is written there, as well as writing to express oneself. On the other hand, nonverbal expressive or receptive communication includes things like pointing, facial expressions, gestures, and body language. We will keep referring back to this figure later as we go through the case profiles. So I wanted to bring this up before we go there. Okay. The other part to remember is that speech and communication is closely linked with other areas of development. They include or overall understanding, right? And here I'm separating understanding or intellectual functioning from uh, the understanding of language or receptive communication, which I mentioned before. In addition, other areas of development that we need to think about are attention, the child's social skills. How does he play with people, children, toys, academic skills, and motor skills? 
motor skills include both his cross motor skills how does the child use his big muscles run play jump around and fine motor skills the ability to use the smaller muscles of his fingers to write hold things and do uh, precise tasks like drawing you know stitching sticking like that okay so when we meet a child with speech delays or when parents come to us with speech delays this is a very simple approach and i mean it's it's just very simple i'm very sure most of you are doing this already but let's just go over it the first part is let's remember that speech delays are often missed in the early years and why is that because there is lack of awareness about what normal milestones may look like so we always want to ask parents about their child's communication also there are lots of myths as dr vela already mentioned we will also be talking about some of those myths later so given this limited awareness and the bountiful myths that exist we want to make sure we ask parents specifically about the child's communication so when they come to you you may say tell me how does sheila ask for what she wants okay or you might want to ask them okay tell me how does your child understand and respond to what you say to her why it asks so specifically because if we say ha wo bolta hai na so the parents might say ha ha bolta hai because the parents understanding of bolta hai may be very different from what you know is typical okay observe child's communication patterns so look at the child does the child look at you does he or she babble does she point to the toys that you have kept on your table maybe point to the pictures in your room call out to the child see does the child respond to you when you call out you know maybe keep one or two big picture you know picture books on your table see if the child shows any interest in the pictures point a picture book to a child ask the child simple questions he how old are you which school do you go to and see how do they respond do you have a pet at home so things that are likely to be answerable by young children why do we ask and observe because the idea is to get a sense of what is the child's typical uh, child's milestones so that we can match it with what we understand of what is typical when can i slightly interrupt you here yes. and ask you what i mean i know I, I, it's a very detailed subject what are the typical milestones but you know for the benefit of our uh, listeners if you could give us a rough guideline of what to expect when and by what age if you know this is not happening you know we should really yes you yes. say use a tool but everybody may not have an access to this yes yes thank you so um that's absolutely correct so very very simply and just rule of thumb we say that a child starts babbling you know bab 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 by the time they're 6 to 8 months old by 8 to 10 months they have started to point to show what they like or want by 12 months they should have started to use a few words or word like sounds which is like do do is not so much a word but it's more like a word approximation or bicky for biscuit or gummy for going outside so roughly about 10 to 12 words by a time the child is 12 months old is what a child says by the time the child is 2 years old uh, these words have expanded to about 40 to 50 words at least and the child also starts joining words so mama chalo gummy chalo go bye bye give bicky bicky de do so kids by two should have started joining two words and by the time they are three their phrases become more complex some kids start saying small sentences this is expressive communication similarly for receptive by one year a child should have definitely started to understand one step simple instructions mujhe de do ball de do darwaza khol do open the window come sit here so these are very simple instructions that the child should have been you know should do across different settings by the year uh, of one year age of one year by two a child can understand two step simple commands okay get me your uh, bowl and a uh, spoon you know i'll give you something to eat so get the bowl and spoon 
or put this down and call mama. So these are two-step instructions that children start to understand by two. Similarly, often parents have concerns about clarity. So again, a rule of thumb, by age one, children, what they say are like about 25% understandable by others. By age two, what they say should be understandable about 50% of the time to other people by three, 75%. And by age four, almost all of what they say or all of what they say should be understandable and clear to people around them, right? So that's another thing that you could keep in mind. So is that okay, Bela? Yeah, okay. So as Bela pointed out, that we need to be mindful of milestones. Um, we also have said that we also want to ask and observe other areas of child development. What is he doing in school? How does he play with other kids? And we want to be careful that are there any high risk factors? Because we know that prematurity, low birth weight, these are very known high risk factors for speech delay and other developmental delays. Similarly, maternal depression, because language has to be learned in the context of a relationship with a caring mother. And if a mother is very depressed, you know, postnatal depression just after birth, uh, then this, this relationship may not be able to provide the stimulation that a child needs. Similarly, poverty and poor levels of maternal education have been shown repeatedly to hamper and challenge children's language development, okay? So now this is Sumit, who uh, Dr. Bela is going to tell us about. Okay, so Sumit is a two and a half year old child, uh, Dr. Koili, he's active, he's playful. Mother says he started saying some words, but the words are very few and they seem to be very unclear. Not everybody can understand what he's saying. He is not very attentive and parents say that often when they call out to him, he may not pay attention unless you speak to him very loudly. When asked if he can hear, parents are very sure that he can hear. He's saying, ha ha, he responds to everything when the puja bell is ringing. If something suddenly falls, he'll startle. He hears a pressure cooker. He hears the ringing of bells. Uh, in your room, uh, he will point around to the stethoscope and he's scared of the doctor. He understands and he's uttering some words, something like otter, ui, and he seems to be scared. Mother reassures him, what would be your next step? What are your first thoughts when you, when you see somebody like Sumit? Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Vela. So Sumit is two and a half. Like we said, by two, we should have expected that Sumit should have been speaking quite a few words, probably even joining words. And to some extent he is, he's saying auto ui, but it's clear that he's not, you know, he's missing some sounds. He's not saying the sounds that we expect by now. Also, it's interesting that uh, parents are worried that he doesn't seem to hear everything. So while he can hear some loud sounds, parents are not sure if he can hear everything. So, in this, we are definitely seeing concerns both about expressive as well as receptive communication. And one of the first things we want to do if you're assessing a child for speech delay is to make sure that we get the child assessed for hearing, right? So many places are offering OAE or autoacoustic emissions uh, right after birth. Um, in case the child has missed a neonatal screen, I think it's important that we send him for a good hearing test and a bearer would definitely uh, help us figure out for sure if the child is, you know, cleared it or not. The point to mention is that if parents tell you the child can hear some loud sounds, it does not mean that the child can hear everything. I've, you know, come across children whose hearing loss, moderate hearing loss has been missed for years just because the child has been able to hear certain things. So let's just keep that in mind, that ability to hear certain sounds does not ensure us that the child does not have a hearing loss and we should definitely get the child assessed for hearing. Uh, so this was the second kid. That Sumit has basically not developed his expressive language because he hasn't been able to hear clearly. Yes. So once we correct that, uh, Sumit's problem, there's nothing actually wrong with his mind or he has no deficiency in communication that way, in that way, but it's just because he hasn't heard enough, he can't speak well enough. So that's probably the case of Sumit over here. Absolutely, Bela. And what is also possible that kids like Sumit will use a lot of actions to compensate for, you know, their uh, difficulties in being able to speak. 
So Correct. they will join words, use actions because they want to be understood and they realize that, you know, I may not be able to do that. So they yeah, thanks. Message across. So again, that sometimes causes parents to seek uh, any kind of help. Uh, so that could delay uh, diagnosis as well as uh, maybe treatment. Yes. We'll move on to the second case. Uh, case two is Pranav. Pranav is a three-year-old boy whose parents are concerned that he does not yet talk to other children. He does not like to talk to other children. He has about 70 words, can say his alphabet from A to Z, name colors, sings rhymes, but does not join the words when he's speaking. He does not make many actions with the rhymes. It is difficult for him to make eye contact with people. And he doesn't always respond when you call out to his name. He can respond sometimes, but largely he will just not respond to his name. He does not seem interested in toys, except that he loves his toy truck. He's brought it to the clinic today. He plays with it all the time. Parents say he is obsessed with his toy you know, vehicles and he will go everywhere with them. He doesn't leave the house without this. So what are your first thoughts on somebody like Sumit? He has 70 words, you know, he, it's, it's not like he, you know, doesn't have any language at all. So where do you think the concerns are over here? I know that he's not making eye contact. <laughs> yes. So the first thing is um, whenever parents come and parents say that they are concerned, we want to address that concern because it's very rarely that parents will come and say that they are worried about a child if there is no cause for concern about their development. The mother probably spends all her you know, time with this child and she has a pretty good sense of what is this child able to do. And many parents or especially mothers say that, you know, they have brought up concerns, but they've been told, you know, don't worry, this is nothing to worry about and things like that. So uh, my first point would be, if a parent is bringing up a concern, let's pay weightage to that. Let's hear her out. He's three years old. He has about 70 words. Now, we might think, well, like you said, Bela, that he has a lot of words. But what he doesn't do is he does not join words. Now, that's very interesting. Parents are saying that he's very bright. He, he knows all his alphabets. He can name colors, which means we are hearing that his understanding of concepts is good. On the other hand, he's able to sing songs, but he does not join words. Now, that is not how typical development of language happens, right? The other thing is, we just saw a child with hearing loss who has lesser words, less clarity, but uses a lot of actions to talk about what he wants to do and what he wants to say. Here's Pranav, who's not even making simple actions with rhymes. So that is another red flag. You look at him, and while parents have not really said anything about eye contact, but you see, when you call out to him, he's not really looking at you. He's probably more interested in the picture of the vehicles behind there, or he's brought in his own toy car, and he keeps playing with it. Okay. Now, parents say, yeah, you know, he usko bas ye khilona hi pasand hai, gaadi pasand hai, aur sirf isko leke karta rehta hai, bada ho ke ye pakka, you know, automobile engineer banne wala hai. What is coming out for us? So what we are seeing is that definitely there are concerns about expression. He's not really speaking the way that other kids at this age should be doing. He's not making sentences. But that's not all. We realize that there are also difficulties in the nonverbal part of communication. He's not making as many actions as children should do. In addition, there are concerns about his social skills because he's not looking at you. He's not responding to your efforts to communicate with him. And his play is very limited. Three-year-olds don't just play only with one thing. They will play with this and that. And even with a car, they will do a little bit more. So this is giving us an idea that this child's communication skills, both verbal and nonverbal, social skills and play skills are Hampered. Where do we see this? We see this in a child with autism spectrum disorder. And I want to point out that there is some, you know, there are sometimes misconceptions that we cannot diagnose autism before three years of age. And we have seen 
that children with autism nowadays can be reliably diagnosed by 18 months and definitely by two years of age. So once again, the message is, uh, if you see children who fit this kind of profile, encourage them to seek a diagnostic evaluation. And, and if they did get diagnosed, say, at two years, what is it that, you know, we can help them to, you know, how can we help people to improve these skills? Uh, I, I don't know if this is the right time to ask this question, but, you know, how early diagnosis, how would early diagnosis really help in achieving a better outcome? Yeah. Um, so this question is absolutely appropriate for every single child that we're going to see today, because, you um, I mean, early intervention, early treatment helps everywhere, more so than anything in ch uh, child development, because the first few years of the child's development are most crucial. It's what we call as the brain's plastic. It's learning new things, new connections are being made. And this is the time when we want to help children acquire the skills that they have not been, uh, they've not been able to acquire naturally. So we want them to help that through therapy, through targeted intervention. And early intervention is the only thing with therapy that has been shown to help children like this gain skills. So once a child is diagnosed, we would like to refer them to a therapist who's trained to work with children with autism. So for instance, at the uh, SRCC Center for Child Development, we have occupational therapists, speech therapists who work with children with such kinds of profile and Bela, they would be the kind of people who work with the children and teach families about what to do. Often we get a resistance. No, 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 no. My husband also spoke at two and a half years old or, you know, everybody in the family spoke late. So we don't want intervention yet. And, you know, so that is a, something I think as a general pediatrician, I see very commonly, you know, coming across from my parents and they, they're not very keen to kind of label, you know, so how can we actually help them without maybe kind of labeling this? Because I think it's quite scary to be said that, oh, we may consider that your child is in the spectrum or something like that. So I think that comes up as a scare sometimes. Okay. And people are resistant to it. Yes. Fair point. Um two sets of conditions, one where the parent is themselves approaching us, you know, in the OPD, as physicians, general physicians, and saying that, you know what, do you think my child speaks, uh, is speaking enough? Do you think that he's delayed? So if there is a concern, like I already said, let's say that, yes, you know, I see your concern, and I'm also observing that there are certain red flags. Why don't we get another opinion with, from someone who's, you know, uh, whose work is to uh, work with children with difficulties and see what they tell us. Uh, the suggestions they give would help us promote a child's development. So we link the parent's concern immediately to the steps that will help the child progress. Secondly, there could be times when the parents, you know, many parents tell me that this is a first child. I don't know, I don't have anybody to compare to. And I'm hearing this a lot during the lockdown period because parents are not going out. They can't compare to another child playing in the park. And they said, we don't know. But when they're going for the vaccination shots, when they're going for the regular, uh, you know, jukam and things, when the, the doctor asks specifically, do you have any concerns about your child's communication? Then parents may say it or, you know, if you're, an, uh, if you're observing the child for a very long time, you notice, hmm, this child is not really looking at me. He's not responding when I'm calling out to him. And I think I would like to share this with the parent and tell them, this is what I'm not seeing. And do you think that we could do two things? I'm going to tell you some things that you can do at, as parents at home. Start doing that. But meanwhile, maybe also see a therapist who could give a little bit more specialized input. And what people can say to parents have included that in the end, and we will definitely go over that. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vela. Thank, Thank you so much, Vela, for your question. Should we move on to Anita? You were telling me about Anita. Anita is three years old. Okay. She's come because the teachers have concerns about her poor social skills in school play. They say she does not mix up with other children and is not picking up alphabets at all. Uh, in, your, in the clinic, I have noticed that Anita is initially clingy, watching quietly. Uh, she's sort of clinging and she 
then finally later manages to get some confidence separates from the parents and starts playing with the toys uh and there's a toy doll which she has started to like and you know she likes to wants to call it her little baby you note however that she's using just single words not making short sentences or phrases uh she's a healthy child and has had no sort of history of ear infections or you know anything to suggest that there could be a hearing problem she has begun to use a uh, you know words at about 20 months and now has about 10 words at 3 years she has only 10 words she's following simple commands with a gesture and can point to a couple of body parts you know she will say that this is my nose this is my ear now how would how would one kind of go ahead and you know figure out what's really going on with anita here you know there are sort of mixed signals here we don't really know what's going on yeah yeah so let's look at anita so anita is 3 and um i mean we spoke about boys initially and this one is a little girl and yeah, it is I said boys speak later than girls which i don't think yeah. is yeah yeah so um well yes and boys do have more language delays for some instances but also so do girls and here's a little girl who obviously started speaking late she is speaking up and uh, she has about 10 words which is way less than what we expect at 3 years she's also following simple one step instructions i think you said that she could start pointing to two body parts show her nose or show her ear um there seem to be some concerns about her social skills uh but uh, i think she also got over them so they are not very pervasive and her play seems to be appropriate you know three year olds do a lot of pretend play so she's obviously pretending that the little doll is a baby and she's acting uh, as if she's working with a little baby so that's good so where do we see the difficulties we are seeing that definitely there is difficulties in um oral skills you know speaking as per age uh, we do expect that she would listen or follow more complicated instructions instructions but she's not doing that and um i think you also said that uh did you also say yeah she's not picking up alphabet so the teacher did say that too right in three in play group people are children nowadays expected to start identifying simple alphabets and she's not picking that up but what's interesting is that she's making actions she's pointing um while social skills may be a little bit of a difficulty but not prominently right yeah but, so this could be what is often called as late language emergence or a, a language disorder and there are both mixed expressive and receptive language difficulties so this is not fitting into the autism spectrum range but there are certain language concerns here yes and i think um we we need to make that difference between why is this not autism and why is this you know more late language uh, emergence or language disorder we are not hearing that her play is very restricted she's able to do fairly age appropriate play while she was initially a little shy but she came down she got over it she started interacting so those are good things that go against a diagnosis of autism right but we still want to take action here because about 40 to 50% of children who have a profile like this where it's not autism or it's you know not hearing loss but just late language acquisition they will still go on to have learning difficulties so we don't want to ignore this and you know bela you had asked this question before that people say that don't worry she will catch up and we don't want to wait and see if this child will catch up or not because there's a fair chance almost one in two chance that she may go on to have learning difficulty she already is having difficulties with writing alphabets which is one of the most you know pre language uh, pre literacy skill and this may persist and even become more so we okay. want to pick this up great 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 so shall we move on to the next case yes so we have Shob uh, shobit Mm -hmm. uh shobit is uh, now 3 years old and uh, he was delivered prematurely mm -hmm. he can now take a few unsteady steps so he has obviously some motor delay here as well he has started to make a lot of sounds that sound like he is speaking but that's not actually very clear doesn't make sense to anybody else 
Maybe his mom understands, but nobody else understands what he's really saying. He has four to five meaningful words. He is interested in playing with toys, but will often simply break them, turn them over and not play properly with them. He gives you a big smile, makes simple actions when you say a simple poem and gives you the pen on your table when you ask him to do so. So he's following a simple instruction over here. But he is not all there and he's not yet speaking and he's three years old already. Uh, let's say he was he was a 28 to 30, 30 weeks. So he was fairly premature. He had a lot of catching up to do. He spent some time in the NICU. So there were going to be some delays overall in his development. And now how do we take this in context with his speech at three years? Yeah. So, um, Bela, may I ask you a question here? Um, because this is something that parents often ask me. They keep telling me that, um, you know, uh, Dr. This child was born premature, right? And we were told that we should correct for prematurity. He's expected to do this. So what do you tell such parents about prematurity and when to correct? Till when to correct? I, I think the correction is there in the, uh, it may be the first year you would still worry about correction. I think beyond that, and Dr. Udani can also comment on this if she would like to, she sees a lot of this. I think after that, uh, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. You know, the, the correction is more in terms of the early milestones or maybe the weight gain and the size of the head and the height and stuff like that. We would correct for stuff, you know, for para parameters like this. But when it comes to actual development, by the time you're two and three, you would kind of put them into the, the same, uh, uh, you know, band as the other children who were not born prematurely. I think one would stop correcting at about that point. Yes, absolutely. That I mean, Max, we would correct till is about the age of two. And um, the other thing to remember is that prematurity is one of the most commonly, you know, uh, known factors for delays. So to yes. keep that in mind uh, and to be on high alert when we are uh, seeing kids who have a history of prematurity. So here is Shobit. He's three. He's not even a steady, confident walker yet, right? So then definitely there are motor delays. Yes. Uh, he seems to be speaking in jargon. But, uh, if he's saying four to five meaningful words and a lot of, you know, nonsense kind of thing. So, uh, so this is jargon. This is what we mean by jargon. Um, he's, he's playing with toys. But what it sounds like is that he seems to be pretty playing with like a much younger kid, maybe like a one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old at the most, because he doesn't know what to do with them still. He shakes them, rattles them, throws them, breaks them. Uh, but he's social. He looks at you, gives you this big smile. Uh, if you say, you know, take him more. So he follows actions with you. And you say, okay, show it. Pen, de mala pen. And he gives you that pen. So he's following that instruction. So what do we see? Here we see that a child here is social, he's friendly, but his motor skills are, you know, are definitely delayed. His parents have already said his verbal skills are delayed. Um, but then, you know, non-verbal seems to be fairly okay. However, overall understanding of concepts is also delayed. So when we see delays in more than one area of development, we are looking at what we call as global developmental delay. Okay, and this is, these are the children who usually may go on to have what is called as intellectually disability, intellectual disability later on, which is diagnosed with an IQ test post about seven years of life. So that is Shobit. Should we move on, Bela? Yeah, okay. I, I just want to make one comment about Shobit is that whereas we understand this is global and the prematurity is just giving us a cause for his global developmental delay. Right. When we say we correct for it, it doesn't mean we don't, try to work towards improving this global developmental delay. We don't have to sit and wait for something. Whenever we see any kind of delay, we should try to work towards helping uh, to overcome that delay uh, in whatever therapeutic way we can do. That's the only comment I want to make over there. That's a very valid point. Yeah, that the wait and watch approach is not what we want to take when we are working on children's development. And we want to be able to provide parents with simple ideas or have them see someone who can provide them with simple ideas how to stimulate the child's development. So yes, very valid point. So we will now move to our next case. Okay. Um, so this is Pallavi. Pallavi is a six-year-old girl whose parents worry that she's completely silent at school. 
uh, her teachers have never heard her speak in school and therefore school has raised a concern that maybe there is some problem with Pallavi. She will go at lunch break, she'll sit quietly away from other children. However, she's academically quite good. She completes all her exams, she gets good marks. Her parents say that she is no problem of speaking at school. She'll chatter away she's, when she's alone with family members. You have also noticed in the clinic that, you know, Pallavi never speaks and you yourself feel a little bit concerned about that. She watches you silently and, you know, as you're talking to her parents, but she doesn't actually have anything to say for herself. She will never, and when you ask her a question, she won't ask. You give her a puzzle, she will complete it. She draws beautiful pictures. So she seems to be, you know, fairly intelligent, but here she is somebody who just won't speak. What do you make of somebody like that? You know, what, what is it? What is this about? Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, she's six. She's six already. And um, this is the time when uh, little girls are very, very chatty. They have so much to talk about. They want to talk about friends. They want to talk about what they did at school, about somebody's new dress, about this. So, and school is where they have lots of fun and lots of friends. And usually parents will tell you, they keep talking. When you hear a parent, in fact, come and tell you that this little girl just doesn't talk at school, we want to acknowledge the parent's concerns. So what is going on? And what's even more interesting is a very, um, you know, uh, opposite picture. The parents are telling you, look, doctor, here's a video. You know, she talks so much that day. Uh, she told us one big story about what happened, whose birthday it was. She knows everything that is there in studies. When I take up a study, she tells me everything. But then she goes to school and she doesn't open her mouth. She has no friends. Uh, you know, she just watches there. And you, you've seen her since she's a baby. And you want to talk to her. Hi, Pallavi. Kya hua? Batao. And she will look at you. She smiles, but she doesn't say anything. And, you know, she will draw there like, say it. So this is interesting. This is a very uh, interesting picture where you are seeing difficulties in her oral comprehension, uh, oral expressive skills, right? So her written expression skills are actually fine. She's able to write in her answer. She's able to draw, express herself, but she's not speaking. The other thing that is impacted significantly are her social skills, especially in unfamiliar or new situations beyond her home and family setting, okay? So when we see something like this, this is a somewhat rarer condition called selective mutism. So children with selective mutism, and they may be both boys and girls, but this is a condition that is somehow more prevalent in girls. Um, these are children whose parents will tell you this exact same thing. They talk a lot at home with the parents, with the brothers and uh, uh, siblings, but they go outside and they, it's as if they're zipped. They will not talk or barely maybe say one or two things. And what is often there is that there's a significant amount of anxiety about speaking in unfamiliar settings. And what I want to emphasize is because there is already so much anxiety here, one of the things that parents often do is, tell him, you know, and it is guaranteed that this child will say even less when we force her to reply or to say things like this. Great, great. So, so uh, I mean, this is this some of the cases we've highlighted. And now I would like to kind of move on to what are the, you know, initial, uh, you know, of course, through our history, through, through the site sort of uh, case scenarios, we come to know what, where we are, you know, where we're headed in which direction we're headed. But what are the, some of the basic investigations and how would you kind of go forward with this, uh, uh, problem with somebody who's not speaking as much as they should. Okay. So uh, the thing is, it's not a very long list of investigations, okay? Because what is truly helpful in diagnosis is good clinical judgment. That is the gold standard, clinical judgment. But we, like we said, we definitely want to rule out a hearing loss if we are thinking of speech delay. We want to look for any dysmorphological features. Are there genetic conditions? Are there symptoms like, you know, child with Down syndrome, of course, will have delayed speech and development, uh, uh, speech and language along with other delays. So looking for dysmorphological features, we should rule out 
some of the common causes for intellectual disability. We want to get a thyroid profile done. And one of the things that is becoming more commonly asked for, and this is what a geneticist, or if you're referring to a specialist may ask for, is a chromosomal microarray. Uh, but like I said, the diagnosis is still gold standard is clinical judgment. Okay. So moving on, uh, if we move on from there, I think um, we, the most important thing is that if there aren't a lot of investigations, there is no point in, you know, asking the child or the family, the family to wait for a long time. We don't want to delay starting on early intervention. Let's get intervention started as soon as possible. Um, we want to send them to whoever is available. There might be some places where a speech therapist is not available. You might have a physical therapist who works with children with speech delays also, who may at least be able to provide some stimulation strategies to parents. That's okay. You might have a Balwadi or an Anganwadi teacher who might be able to help in your area. I think so the suggestion is that let the availability of a therapist not be a barrier, but to look for people who are experienced in working with young children and to seek intervention. I mean, often one finds that, you know, schools will say that, oh, they're not speaking, so let's not have them in school. In fact, it should be the other way down. I think the, you know, the, them going socializing with other children would actually help them to develop their communication skills better. And yeah. that's something parents should be encouraged to do and schools should be encouraged, you know, as, as, you know, as a doctor of fraternity, we should encourage schools to be more inclusive towards such children so that they that have more opportunity for social skills to develop and therefore uh, be able to integrate better uh, within uh, the community and to learn communication skills better, not to hide away in a corner. I think that's very important. Yes. And I think the part about inclusion is so important and what you describe as a role in supporting children's entry into schools. And the other part is also talking to parents because as soon as parents of young children get the children into school, they start worrying about the academic skills. Oh, he's not writing yet. Mm -hmm. But if we, if the idea is that school should be a place where the child learns to interact and engage with other kids, let's make that our focus and not get bogged down by what we bet or not. That will happen. Exactly. So, so it doesn't matter. They should go to school, I think. You know, I think that socialization is very, very important. Uh, can I move on to the questions now, Dr. Kohli? Is there anything else? Are, are there any sort of, uh, we were talking about myths, you know, so certain myths yeah. are uh, in the, yeah. uh, you know, what some common questions are there. Uh, as you've yeah. said, uh, what you said. Was, uh, I was wondering if we could just quickly talk about what we can tell parents okay. and then move on to the myths, right? Okay. I mean, we've kind of covered this and these are some things that, um, our participating physicians today could, in fact, tell all families it, that it won't harm parents if they do this. Uh, the first thing is don't force the child to talk, right? Don't keep saying, bolo iska naam kya hai, bolo tum ye bolo. When we keep saying bolo, 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 in fact, the child doesn't really bolo. It doesn't say much. So that's something that we want to stop doing. But instead, talk to your child, use short, simple phrases. There's another thing that I've often heard parents being told that talk a lot to your child. When we talk a lot to a child and keep talking, it's like playing a game of tennis where you don't allow your opponent to hit back. Okay, So talk enough, use short, simple phrases, single words so that the child can focus. Read simple books together that have pictures on it, not just ABCD books. Be animated so the child feels motivated to look at you, right? Uh, in your daily routines, involve the child. Okay, we are going to take a bath. It's done on the tap. <gasps> Hot water. So talk, name things in everyday uh, activities. And that's one of the ways in which you can stimulate children to language. Follow your child's interests, especially in children with autism. You know, we said that a child may or may not be interested in all things. But it's okay. Allow the child to play with what he is interested in and respond to his play. So here you see a mother 
the child likes to bang with a spoon what the mother has done is taken another spoon bigger kachi and she's saying to cook with it so she goes speak up with that so she is not forcing him to give it up forcing him to do alphabets but she's trying to see how she can get him to look interact with him by using his choice okay so should do you want to then you know ask me about some questions uh so so some of the sort of uh, you know uh, common myths that are going around or, or, or ideas that are sort of uh, floating around mm -hmm. uh, a lot of parents will say oh my child only sees educational uh, dvds you know i put on these very and that is going to help him to speak mm -hmm. uh, is that true uh, would tv and dvds help a child to speak you know so children learn language in the context of relationships when somebody talks to them listens to what they are saying says something back it's a given thought and the tv or dvd is just a one way street so while they may hear you know pick up songs pick up rhymes even repeat some words but true language and communication is picked up when they are talking to someone in a give and take relationship so it is it may not hamper most children but it's definitely not what's teaching them to speak correct i think we've already talked about this do boys speak later than girls and should we be worried if a boy by 2 is not saying anything yeah i think yes we should worry about it we should be worried i mean uh, any child boy or girl who is not picking up single words by one doesn't have about half a you know a dozen or more words by the time they're one and a half years old we should be worried we should um more than worried i think we should get help i think yeah. i did not to worry parents yeah. but to tell them i see some things uh, and get it means simple interventions at home but to to encourage them to do that yes okay. uh and uh, very few families feel you know now we have you know multicultural families you know mother speaks marathi father speaks telugu you know stuff like that does that hamper the the language development in a child uh, hearing many languages as they growing up so what research tells us is that for a child whose language trajectory is okay i mean those who are primed to pick up language having two languages being spoken at home doesn't really matter because a number of words they will pick up including say english and hindi or hindi and marathi will be the same mm -hmm. however what we do see is that if a child language skills are already devel already delayed is struggling to speak pick up words then being exposed to multiple languages may not help him and may instead help if parents use similar words consistently but just having two different languages does not cause a does not cause a delay correct correct we talked about this also that you know and, and you know the parent has spoken later other members in the family and the families are always saying so let's wait let's wait you know he will catch up so yeah. how far should we go with that you know like should we just uh, wait or should we do something about it you already answered that question during yes yeah i mean that that's i think we spoke about it that even if it's not autism or it's not uh, you know intellectual disability or global delays and even if it's late language emergence we know that one out of two kids will continue to have language difficult uh, learning difficulties even later so the point is to intervene early when children pick up skills they go on and move on and do better that's fine no no harm done uh, it's better to intervene early than to wait and watch and of course with any any kind of problem that affects our children the parents are always worried did i do something wrong is it my yeah. fault that yeah. is something that is a very very common thread for any illness yeah. not yeah. just yeah including questions like we are a neutral family you know i go out to work and you know so all kinds of guilt but i think that's where our role is also to reassure parents that they are not to blame many of these delays uh, children acquire prime to acquire and it's not really that they did something wrong but rather shift the discussion to what parents can do to now support the child's development correct before we summarize and we uh, come to an end there are some audience questions yeah sure. and i think there are a couple of questions and they're all kind of related to stuttering so um, that is something maybe we didn't touch upon and what why does it happen what is stuttering is that a speech uh, impediment and uh, does cognitive behavioral therapy work with it so if you could just tell us a little bit about stuttering yeah sure 
So stuttering uh, is a, a difficulty of fluency. So, you know, children who are not able to speak very fluently and they may repeat the same sound again. Now, uh, this can happen even developmentally as part of the typical trajectory of development, more so in boys around the ages of say three to five years. And this is also because at this age, kids have a lot to say, you know, uh, but their ability to communicate is not in, in par with uh, how much they have to say. And there's a rush to say a lot of things and they kind of stumble upon their words and they say a lot. Um, the idea is to model a slower pace of speech for parents and caregivers. Yes, tell me about it. Uh, you know, okay, is that what happened? And not to constantly correct them. So we don't want to keep telling children that, you know, say that properly. You didn't say it correctly because correction is not what we want to do. We want to model the word they stuttered on and to be able to give them the sense that we are here to listen and I have time to listen to you. So, but if it persists in many children, the stuttering, they uh, move over, they go past this developmental period of disfluency. But if they continue to have this, I would definitely recommend meet a speech therapist. Okay. And I think another concern, I mean, nobody has asked this question, but another concern is when you can't pronounce certain alphabets, you know, the kind of baby speech that we have, you know, you can't mm -hmm. say go and go and go and, you know, certain uh, alphabets are a little harder to pronounce. Yes. And what would you suggest for that, you know, like? Uh, right. So um, it depends once again on the age. Dr. Bela, we spoke about how children become fairly clear. Almost all of their words should be able to be understood by the time they're about four. And before that, we expect some uh, lack of clarity. They may mix up some sounds, not be able to pronounce the last sounds of certain words. Um, I think it depends. It's, it's where we monitor. If there is a lot of lack of clarity of speech by the time children are four and so on, we want to get an assessment done. However, a little bit of clarity is, ex you know, lack of clarity is expected by the time they're three and you know, four. So that's all right. Yeah, that's it. All right. Great. So, Dr. Koili, would you like to summarize and, you know, give some sort of take home uh, message? Sure. sure. So, we just want to summarize and say that, you know, it is, speech delay is a much more common developmental concern than probably is brought up. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are addressing the different areas of development that could be part of it. A detailed evaluation is very important because we want to start intervention early. And our role as physicians, you know, doctors, those who work with children and their families is to help the parents support the child's development. That's the goal, actually. So thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Kohli. That was really very clear, very lucid. Uh, have some comments. Before. People have said excellent speech, excellent talk, and they're very happy uh, to have been part of it. I hand this back to Dr. Rasik Shah to conclude the meeting. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Bela and uh, Koeli for uh, excellent talk, as well as I think uh, it was very well moderated by uh, Dr. Bela. Uh, very well uh, spoken by Dr. Koeli, summarizing uh, uh, speech delays in children. And uh, uh, I could not join in the beginning because of uh, some surgeries which were going on. Uh, the next talk will be on uh, uh, imaging in chest by Dr. Hiren Panwala. Uh, we will, uh, he will tell us when one should do X-ray chest, sonography, CT scan, MRI, and how to read them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good day. Uh, Bye. As far as uh, children are concerned, whatever is 3 p.m., so maybe we will start the YouTube maybe at 3.20, 3.25 only. Uh, so, no, you want to say anything? No. Uh, nothing more. Okay. So, so we will conclude the session. Uh, anyone, anything, if it has to be... Uh, uh, anyone wants to contribute, otherwise we'll conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Cole.
Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Bela. Very nice, Koyli and Bela. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. We shall conclude this meeting.